Chapter 9. The World in a Wall The crumbling wall that surrounded the sunken garden alongside the house was a rich hunting ground for me. It was an ancient brick wall that had been plastered over, but now this outer skin was green with moss, bulging and sagging with the damp of many winters. The whole surface was an intricate map of cracks, some several inches wide, others as fine as hairs. Here and there large pieces had dropped off and revealed the rows of rose-pink bricks lying beneath like ribs. There was a whole landscape on this wall if you peered closely enough to see it. The roofs of a hundred tiny toadstools, red, yellow and brown, showed in patches like villages on the damper portions. Mountains of bottle green moss grew in tuffets, so symmetrical that they might have been planted and trimmed. Forests of small ferns spouted from cracks in the shady places, drooping languidly like little green fountains. The top of the wall was a desert land, too dry for anything except a few rust-red mosses to live in it, too hot for anything except sunbathing by the dragonflies. At the base of the wall grew a mass of plants, cyclamen, crocus, asphodel, thrusting their leaves among the piles of broken and chipped roof tiles that lay there. This whole strip was guarded by a labyrinth of blackberry, hung in season with fruit that was plump and juicy and black as ebony. The inhabitants of the wall were a mixed lot, and they were divided into day and night workers, the hunters and the hunted. At night, the hunters were the toads that lived among the brambles, and the geckos, pale, translucent with bulging eyes that lived in cracks higher up the wall. Their prey was the population of stupid, absent-minded crane flies that zoomed and barged their way among the leaves, moths of all shapes and sizes, moths striped, tessellated, checked, spotted and blotched, that fluttered in soft clouds among the withered plaster. The beetles, rotund and neatly clad as businessmen, hurrying with portly efficiency about their night's work. When the last glowworm had dragged his frosty emerald lantern to bed over the hills of moss and the sun rose, the wall was taken over by the next set of inhabitants. Here it was more difficult to differentiate between the prey and the predators, for everything seemed to feed indiscriminately off everything else. Thus the hunting wasps searched out caterpillars and spiders, the spiders hunted for flies, the dragonflies, big, brittle and hunting pink, fed off the spiders and the flies, and the swift, lithe and multicoloured wall lizards fed off everything. But the shyest and most self-effacing of the wall community were the most dangerous. You hardly ever saw one unless you looked for it, and yet there must have been several hundred living in the cracks of the wall. Slide a knife blade carefully under a piece of the loose plaster and lever it gently away from the brick, and there, crouching beneath it, would be a little black scorpion, an inch long, looking as though he were made out of polished chocolate. They were weird-looking things, with their flattened oval bodies, their neat crooked legs, the enormous crab-like claws, bulbous and neatly jointed as an armour, and the tail like a string of brown beads, ending in a sting like a rose-thorn. The scorpion would lie there quite quietly as you examined him, only ra raising his tail in an almost apologetic gesture of warning if you breathed too hard on him. If you kept him in the sun too long, he would simply turn his back on you and walk away, and then slide slowly but firmly under another section of plaster. I grew very fond of these scorpions. I found them to be pleasant, unassuming creatures with, on the whole, the most charming habits. Provided you did nothing silly or clumsy, like putting your hand on one, the scorpions treated you with respect, their one desire being to get away and hide as quickly as possible. They must have found me rather a trial, for I was always ripping sections of the plaster away so that I could watch them, or capturing them and making them walk about in jam jars so they could, I could see the way their feet moved. By means of my sudden and unexpected assaults on the wall, I discovered quite a bit about the scorpions. I found that they would eat blue bottles, though how they caught them was a mystery I never solved, grasshoppers, moths and lacewing flies. Several times I found them eating each other a habit I found most distressing in a creature otherwise so impeccable. By crouching under the wall at night with a torch, I managed to catch some brief glimpses of the scorpion's wonderful courtship dances. I saw them standing, claws clasped, their bodies raised to the skies, their tails lovingly entwined. I saw them waltzing slowly in circles among the moss cushions, claw in claw. 
but my view of these performances was all too short, for almost as soon as I switched on the torch, the partners would stop, pause for a moment, and then seeing that I was not going to extinguish the light, they would turn and walk firmly away, claw in claw, side by side. They were definitely beasts that believed in keeping themselves to themselves. If I could have kept a colony in captivity, I would probably have been able to see the whole of the courtship, but the family had forbidden scorpions in the house, despite my arguments in favour of them. Then one day I found a fat female scorpion in the wall, wearing what at first glance appeared to be a pale fawn fur coat. Closer inspection proved that this strange garment was made up of a mass of tiny babies clinging to the mother's back. I was enraptured by this family, and I made up my mind to smuggle them into the house and up to my bedroom so that I might keep them and watch them grow up. With infinite care, I manoeuvred the mother and the family into a matchbox and then hurried to the villa. It was rather unfortunate that just as I entered the door, lunch should be served. However, I placed the matchbox carefully on the mantelpiece in the drawing room so that the scorpion should get plenty of air and made my way to the dining room and joined the family for the meal. Dawdling over my food, feeding Roger surreptitiously under the table and listening to the family arguing, I completely forgot about my exciting new captures. At last, Larry, having finished, fetched the cigarettes from the drawing room and lying back on his chair, he put one in his mouth and picked up the matchbox he had brought. Oblivious of my impending doom, I watched him interestedly as, still talking glibly, he opened the matchbox. Now, I maintain to this day that the female scorpion meant no harm. She was agitated and a trifle annoyed at being shut up in a matchbox for so long, and so she seized the first opportunity to escape. She hoisted herself out of the box with great rapidity, her babies clinging on desperately, and scuttled onto the back of Larry's hand. There, not quite certain what to do next, she paused, her sting curved up at the ready. Larry, feeling the movement of her claws, glanced down to see what it was, and from that moment things got increasingly confused. He uttered a roar of fright that made Lugaretzia drop a plate and brought Roger out from beneath the table barking wildly. With a flick of his hand, he sent the unfortunate scorpion flying down the table and she landed midway between Margot and Leslie, scattering babies like confetti as she thumped on the cloth. Thoroughly enraged at this treatment, the creature sped towards Leslie, her sting quivering with emotion. Leslie leapt to his feet, overturning his chair, and flicked out desperately with his napkin, sending the scorpion rolling across the cloth towards Margot, who promptly let out a scream that any railway engine would have been proud to produce. Mother, completely bewildered by this sudden and rapid change from peace to chaos, put on her glasses and peered down the table to see what was causing the pandemonium. And at that moment, Margot, in a vain attempt to stop the scorpion's advance, hurled a glass of water at it. The shower missed the animal completely, but successfully drenched Mother, who, not being able to stand cold water, promptly lost her breath and sat gasping at the end of the table, unable even to protest. The scorpion had now gone to ground under Leslie's plate, while her babies swarmed wildly all over the table. Roger, mystified by the panic, but determined to do his share, ran round and round the room, barking hysterically. It's that bloody boy again, bellowed Larry. Look out! Look out! They're coming! screamed Margot. All we need is a book, roared Leslie. Don't panic! Hit him with a book! What on earth's the matter with you all? Mother kept imploring, mopping her glasses. It's that bloody boy! He'll kill the lot of us! Look at the table! Knee-deep in scorpions! Quick! Quick! Do something! Look out! Look out! Stop screeching! Get a book, for God's sake! You're worse than the dog! Shut up, Roger! By the grace of God, I wasn't bitten. Look out, there's another one. Quick, quick. Oh, shut up. Get me a book or something. But how did the scorpions get on the table, dear? That bloody boy. Every matchbox in the house is a death trap. Look out, it's coming towards me. Quick, quick, do something. Hit it with your knife. Your knife. Go on, hit it. Since no one had bothered to explain things to him, Roger was under the mistaken impression that the family were being attacked and that it was his duty to defend them. As Lugaretzia was the only stranger in the room, he came to the logical conclusion that she must be the responsible party, so he bit her in the ankle. This did not help matters very much. By the time a certain amount of order had been restored, 
all the baby scorpions had hidden themselves under various plates and bits of cutlery. Eventually, after impassioned pleas on my part, backed up by mother, Leslie's suggestion that the whole lot be slaughtered was quashed. While the family, still simmering with rage and fright, retired to the drawing room, I spent half an hour rounding up the babies, picking them up in a teaspoon and returning them to their mother's back. Then I carried them outside on a saucer and, with the utmost reluctance, released them on the garden wall. Roger and I went and spent the afternoon on the hillside, for I felt it would be prudent to allow the family to have a siesta before seeing them again. The results of this incident were numerous. Larry developed a phobia about matchboxes and opened them with utmost caution, a handkerchief wrapped around his hand. Lugaretzia limped around the house, her ankle enveloped in yards of bandage for weeks after the bite had healed and came every morning with the tea to show us how the scabs were getting on. But from my point of view, the worst repercussion of the whole affair was that mother decided I was running wild again and that it was high time I received a little more education. While the problem of finding a full-time tutor was being solved, she was determined that my French, at least, should be kept in trim. So arrangements were made, and every morning Spiro would drive me into the town for my French lesson with the Belgian consul. The consul's house was situated in a maze of narrow, smelly alleyways that made up the Jewish quarter of the town. It was a fascinating area, the cobbled streets crammed with stores that were piled highly with gaily coloured bales of cloth, mountains of shining sweetmeats, ornaments of beaten silver, fruit and vegetables. The streets were so narrow that you had to stand back against the wall to allow the donkeys to stagger past with their loads of merchandise. It was a rich and colourful part of town, full of noise and bustle. The screech of bargaining women, the cluck of hens, the barking of dogs and the wailing cry of the men carrying great trays of fresh hot loaves on their heads. Right in the very centre, in the top flat of a tall rickety building that leant tiredly over a tiny square, lived the Belgian consul. He was a sweet little man, whose most striking attribute was a magnificent three-pointed beard and carefully waxed moustache. He took his job rather seriously and was always dressed as though he were on the verge of rushing off to some important official function in a black cutaway coat, striped trousers, fawn spats over brightly polished shoes, an immense cravat like a silk waterfall held in place by a plain gold pin and a tall and gleaming top hat that completed the ensemble. One could see him at any hour of the day clad like this, picking his way down the dirty narrow alleys, stepping daintily among the puddles, drawing himself back against the wall with magnificently courteous gestures to allow a donkey to pass and tapping it coyly on the rump with his malacca cane. The people of the town did not find his garb at all unusual, they thought he was an Englishman, and as all Englishmen were lords, it was not only right but necessary that they should wear the correct uniform. The first morning I arrived, he welcomed me into the living room whose walls were decorated with a mass of heavily framed photographs of himself in various Napoleonic attitudes. The Victorian chairs, covered with a red brocade, were patched with antimacassars by the score. The table on which we worked was draped in a wine-red cloth of velvet, with a fringe of bright green tassels around the edge. It was an intriguingly ugly room. In order to test the extent of my knowledge of French, the consul sat me down at the table, produced a fat and battered edition of Le Petit La Russe, and placed it in front of me, open at page one. You will please to read this, he said. His gold teeth glittered amicably in his beard. He twisted the points of his moustache, pursed his lips, clasped his hands behind his back and paced slowly across the window while I started down the list of words beginning with A. I had hardly stumbled through the first three when the consul stiffened and uttered a suppressed exclamation. I thought at first he was shocked by my accent, but apparently it was nothing to do with me. He rushed across the room, muttering to himself, tore open a cupboard and pulled out a powerful looking air rifle while I watched him with increasing mystification and interest, not unmixed with a certain alarm for my own safety. He loaded the weapon, dropping pellets all over the carpet in his frantic haste. Then he crouched and crept back to the window, where, half concealed by the curtain, he peered out eagerly. Then he raised the gun, took careful aim at something and fired. When he turned around, slowly and sadly shaking his head, and laid the gun aside, I was surprised to see tears in his eyes. He drew a yard or so of silk handkerchief out of his breast pocket and blew his nose violently. 
Ah, 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 he intoned, shaking his head dolefully. The poor little fellow. But we must work, please. Continue with your reading, mon ami. For the rest of the morning, I toyed with the exciting idea that the consul had committed a murder before my very eyes, or at least that he was carrying out a blood feud with some neighbouring householder. But when, after the fourth morning, the consul was still firing periodically out of his window, I decided that my explanation could not be the right one, unless it was an exceptionally large family he was feuding with, and a family, moreover, who were apparently incapable of firing back. It was a week before I found out the reason for the consul's incessant fusillade, and the reason was cats. In the Jewish quarter, as in other parts of the town, the cats were allowed to breed unchecked. There were literally hundreds of them. They belonged to no one and were uncared for, so that most of them were in a frightful state, covered with sores, their fur coming out in great bald patches, their legs bent with rickets, and all of them so thin that it was a wonder they were alive at all. The consul was a great cat lover, and he possessed three large and well-fed Persians to prove it. But the sight of all these starving, sore-ridden felines stalking about on the rooftops opposite his window was too much for his sensitive nature. I cannot feed them all, he explained to me, so I like to make them happiness by shooting them. They are better, they are better though, though but it makes me feel so sad. He was, in fact, performing a very necessary and humane service, as anyone who had seen the cats would agree. So my lessons in French were being continuously interrupted while the consul leapt to the window to send yet another cat to a happier hunting ground. After the report of the gun, there would be a moment's silence, in respect for the dead. And then the consul would blow his nose violently, sigh tragically, and we would plunge once more into the tangled labyrinth of French verbs. For some inexplicable reason, the consul was under the impression that mother could speak French, and he would never lose an opportunity of engaging her in conversation. If she had the good fortune while shopping in the town to notice his top hat bobbing through the crowd towards her, she would hastily retreat into the nearest shop and buy a number of things she had no use for until the danger was past. Occasionally, however, the consul would appear suddenly out of an alleyway and take her by surprise, he would advance, smiling broadly and twirling his cane, sweep off his top hat and bow almost double before her, while clasping her reluctantly offered hand and pressing it passionately into his beard. Then they would stand in the middle of the street, occasionally being forced apart by a passing donkey, while the consul swamped mother under a flood of French, gesturing elegantly with his hat and stick, apparently unaware of the blank expression on mother's face. Now and then he would punctuate his speech with a questioning, N'est-ce pas, madame? And this was mother's cue. Summoning up all her courage, she would display her complete mastery over the French tongue. Oui, oui, she would exclaim, smiling nervously, and then add, in case it had sounded rather unenthusiastic, oui, oui. This procedure satisfied the consul, and I'm sure he never realised that this was the only French word that mother knew. But these conversations were a nerve-wracking ordeal for her, and we had only to hiss, look out, mother, the consul's coming, to set her tearing off down the street at a ladylike walk that was dangerously near to a gallop. In some ways, these French lessons were good for me. I did not learn any French, it's true, but by the end of the morning I was so bored that my afternoon sorties into the surrounding country were made with double the normal enthusiasm. And then, of course, there was always Thursdays to look forward to. Theodore would come out to the villa as soon after lunch as was decent, and stay until the moon was high over the Albanian mountains. Thursday was happily chosen from his point of view, because it was on this day that the seaplane from Athens arrived, and landed in the bay not far from the house. Theodore had a passion for watching seaplanes land. Unfortunately, the only part of the house from which you could get a good view of the bay was the attic, and then it meant leaning perilously out of the window and craning your neck. The plane would invariably arrive in the middle of tea. A dim, drowsy hum could be heard, so faint one could not be sure it was not a bee. Theodore, in the middle of an anecdote or an explanation, would suddenly stop talking. His eyes would take on a fanatical gleam, his beard would bristle, and he would cock his head to one side. Is that, uh, you know, the, is that the sound of a plane? 
he would inquire. Everyone would stop talking and listen. Slowly the sound would grow louder and louder. Theodore would carefully place his half-eaten scone on his plate. Aha, he would say, wiping his fingers carefully. Yes, that certainly sounds like a plane. Uh, hmm, yes. The sound would grow louder and louder while Theodore shifted uneasily in his seat. At length, Mother would put him out of his misery. Would you like to go up and watch it land? She would ask. Well, uh, if you're sure, Theodore would mumble, vacating his seat with alacrity. I, uh, find uh, the sight very attractive. Uh, if you're sure you don't mind. The sound of the plane's engines would now be heard directly overhead. There was not a moment to lose. I have always been, uh, you know, attracted. Hurry up, Theo, or you'll miss it, we would chorus. The entire family then vacated the table, and gathering Theodore en route, we sped up the four flights of stairs, Roger racing ahead, barking joyfully. We burst into the attic out of breath, laughing, our feet thumping like gunfire on the uncarpeted, uncarpeted floor, threw open the windows, and leaned out, peering over the olive tops to where the bay lay like a round blue eye among the trees, its surface as smooth as honey. The plane, like a cumbersome, overweight goose, flew over the olive groves, sinking lower and lower. Suddenly it would be over the water, racing its reflection over the blue surface. Slowly the plane dropped, lower and lower. Theodore, eyes narrowed, beard bristling, watched it with bated breath. Lower and lower, and then suddenly it touched the surface briefly, left a widening petal of foam, flew on, and then settled on the surface and surged across the bay, leaving a spreading fan of white foam behind it. As it came slowly to rest, Theodore would rasp the side of his beard with his thumb and ease himself back into the attic. Um, yes, he would say, dusting his hands. It is certainly a very, uh, enjoyable sight. The show was over. He would have to wait another week for the next plane. We would shut the attic windows and troop noisily downstairs to resume our interrupted tea. The next week, exactly the same thing would happen all over again. It was on Thursdays that Theodore and I went out together, sometimes confining ourselves to the garden, sometimes venturing further afield. Loaded down with collecting boxes and nets, we wended our way through the olives, Roger galloping ahead of us nose to the ground. Everything that we came across was grist to our mill. Flowers, insects, rocks or birds. Theodore had an apparently inexhaustible fund of knowledge about everything, but he imparted this knowledge with a sort of meticulous diffidence that made you feel he was not so much teaching you something new as reminding you of something which you were already aware of, but which had, for some reason or other, slipped your mind. His conversation was sprinkled with hilarious anecdotes, incredibly bad puns, and even worse jokes, which he would tell with great relish, his eyes twinkling, his nose wrinkled as he laughed silently in his beard, as much at himself as at his own humour. Every water-filled ditch or pool was, to us, a teeming and unexplored jungle, with the minute cyclops and water fleas, green and coral pink, suspended like birds among the underwater branches, while on the muddy bottom the tigers of the pool would prowl, the leeches and the dragonfly larvae, Every hollow tree had to be closely scrutinised in case it should contain a tiny pool of water in which mosquito larvae were living. Every mossy wigged rock had to be overturned to find out what lay beneath it, and every rotten log had to be dissected. Standing straight and immaculate at the edge of a pool, Theodore would carefully sweep his little net through the water, lift it out and peer keenly into the tiny glass bottle that dangled at the end into which all the minute water life had been sifted. Aha, he might say, his voice ringing with excitement, his beard bristling. I believe it's Seriodaphnia laticaudata. He would whip a magnifying glass from his waistcoat pocket and peer more closely. Ah, uh, hmm, yes, very curious. It is laticaudata. Uh, could you just, uh, hand me a clean test tube? Um, thank you. He would suck the minute creature out of the bottle with a fountain pen filler, enshrine it carefully in the tube, and then examine the rest of the catch. 
There doesn't seem to be anything else that's particularly exciting. Uh, ah, yes, I didn't notice. There is rather a curious caddis lava. There. Do you see it? Hmm. It appears to have made its case of the shells of certain mollusks. It's certainly very pretty. At the bottom of the little bottle was an elongated case, half an inch long, constructed out of what appeared to be silk, and thick with tiny flat snail shells like buttons. From one end of this delightful home the owner appeared, an unattractive maggot-like beast with a head like an ant's. Slowly it crawled across the glass, dragging its beautiful house with it. I tried an interesting experiment once, Theodore said. I caught a number of these uh, larvae and removed their shells. Uh, naturally it doesn't hurt them. Uh, then I put them in some jars which contained perfectly clear water and nothing in the way of uh, materials with which to build new cases. Then I gave each set of larvae different coloured materials to build with. Some I gave very tiny blue and green beads, and some I gave chips of brick, white sand, even some uh, uh, fragments of, of coloured glass. They all built new cases out of these different things, and I must say the result was very curious and uh, uh, colourful. They are certainly very clever architects. He emptied the contents of the bottle back into the pool, put his net over his shoulders, and we walked on our way. Talking of building, Theodore continued, his eyes sparkling, did I tell you what happened to a, a friend of mine? Um, yes, well, he had a small house in the country, and as his family, um, increased. He decided that it was not big enough. He decided to add another floor to the house. He was, I think, a little overconfident of his own architectural um, prowess, and he insisted on designing the new floor himself. Mm, ha, yes, well, everything went well, and, and in next to no time the new floor was ready, complete with bedrooms, bathrooms, and so forth. My friend had a party to celebrate the completion of the work. We all drank toasts to the um, uh, new piece of building, and with great ceremony the scaffolding was taken down, um, uh, removed. No one noticed anything, um, anything amiss, until a late arrival at the celebration wanted to look around the new rooms. It was then discovered that there was no staircase. Uh, it appeared that my friend had forgotten to put a staircase in his plans, you know, and during the actual uh, the actual building operations, he and the workmen had got so used to climbing to the top floor by means of the scaffolding that no one apparently noticed the uh, uh, the the defect. So we would walk on through the hot afternoon, pausing by the pools and ditches and streams wading through the heavily scented myrtle bushes, over the hillsides crisp with heather, along white dusty roads where we were occasionally passed by a drooping plodding donkey, carrying a sleepy peasant on its back. Towards evening, our jars, bottles and tubes, full of strange and exciting forms of life, we would turn for home. The sky would be fading to a pale gold as we marched through the olive groves, already dim with shadow, and the air would be cooler and more richly scented. Roger would trot ahead of us, his tongue flapping out, occasionally glancing over his shoulder to make sure we were following him. Theodore and I, hot and dusty and tired, our bulging collecting bags making our shoulders ache pleasantly, would stride along singing a song that Theodore had taught me. It had a rousing tune that gave a new life to tired feet, and Theodore's baritone voice and my shrill treble would ring out gaily through the gloomy trees. There was an old man who lived in Jerusalem, glory, alleluia, hi o Jerum. He wore a top hat and he looked very sprucelum, glory, alleluia, hi o Jerum, hi o Jerum, hi o Jerum. A skinny wrinkle oodle dum, a skinny wrinkle oodle dum, glory, alleluia, hi o Jerum. Thank you.